For those of you who are unaware, this is Greg Locke. Last year, he held a what he called a burning service, okay? This is from February 2nd, 2022 is when this happened. He was burning books and stuff. Books and Ouija boards and other things he deemed to be demonic. Don't breathe that mess back in you, all right? Let that stuff burn. Let it go. But uh, we're going to start this stuff. We got all kinds of Masonic stuff. We got devilish stuff. We got every bit of kind of witchcraft, spell books, everything you can imagine. And uh, this, this thing is full. So we got clothes, a lot of things. So if you need to get rid of it. They had Harry Potter books there, too, that they burned. All you can get, just start throwing it in there. 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 Burn it. Burn it. Burn it. Burn it. They're blowing shofars, which is a traditionally Jewish kind of like a trumpet. It's a ram's horn that they used as a trumpet back in Bible time. So anyway, would you be surprised to find that Greg Locke has announced that he's holding a new burning service in Halloween? He's holding a burning service Halloween night to burn books and demonic things of all different sorts. And interestingly enough, this is the one, this service that we're, we have pulled up here, this is the one where he announces it. This is from October 2nd, 2022. So I figured we're going to start at the beginning and just kind of watch through. If we don't get to finish it by the end of the night, then we're going to continue it tomorrow morning on my unfiltered YouTube channel, Telltale Unfiltered. Oh, there's a link to that YouTube channel in the description. If you missed the live stream, you can just go to the Unfiltered channel and search for it. I'm going to upload an edited video or an edited version of it in a little while. So anyway, I'll tell you what. While we watch Greg Locke come completely unglued over Halloween and other shenaniganery he gets into, let's play Super Mario Land for the... Game Boy, shall we? You may be seated all over the house in the presence of the Lord. You can return to your seat. Thank you so much for being here. If you believe the Lord and His Word and His presence is going to help you today, would you shout amen in the house? There'll always be some form of ridicule. There'll always be some form of persecution. There'll always be some form of censorship. But we'll just keep going, amen? That's all we can do. And we're not going to compromise. This guy is so obsessed with being persecuted 24-7. It's like his favorite pastime to talk about persecution. And there's a reason for that. I've actually been covering this guy's book, like reading his most recent book that he released. It's called This Is War, We Will Not Surrender Through Silence. Yeah, this right here. And actually, we have one chapter left. Anyway, I've been reading this book, and that's the theme of the entire book, pretty much. It's all about how persecuted he is. And he comes out and says why he talks about being persecuted, even though he most definitely is not in any way. The reason is because he thinks that it's going to basically spark a new revival, which will bring about the end or some other thing. He thinks he's about to start Armageddon, basically. That's his whole goal. Compromise truth, just because it makes people feel uncomfortable. Not going to compromise the gospel for a for a bigger crowd. People are coming because of the truth of the gospel. Amen. So, actually, Greg Locke is very inaccurate with his interpretation of the Bible. Like I, he's still a Christian, of course. I'm not going to deny his status as a Christian, but just about everything that he says is contrary to what the Bible would expect. Let me just give you one basic example. Greg Locke says the Bible doesn't want him to compromise and stop holding church service to, through COVID, right? Actually, the Bible says where two or more gather, God is with them. And it says to follow the laws of the land in Romans 13. So Gre Greg Locke, what he should have done actually is he should have split his church into 10-person groups and gone from group to group shepherding each one, each section. That's what he should have done if he wanted to be in line with what the Bible expected of him, which is following government expectations during lockdowns and stuff, right? But no, he didn't. He didn't do any of that. You know what he did? He screamed about being persecuted constantly and refused to lock down his church, refused to even hold Zoom services or... or have them wear masks or anything at all, refuse to do anything. That is straight up unbiblical in my mind. As far as I can tell, 
Greg Locke is a completely unbiblical pastor and talks about how he's the only one that follows the Bible. It's completely ridiculous, honestly. Whatever. You two can have it. That's about 150,000 people that normally watch on that particular platform that aren't able to watch, but they can just hop over on to uh, Zuckerbuck's page. Hey, man, they can hop over. Why do... Okay, this is like the second or third person that I've heard call him Suckabuck. What does that mean? I don't understand. Why does he keep calling him Suckabuck? He's obviously referring to Zuckerberg, right? Mark Zuckerberg from uh, Facebook. Am I missing something? Over there and watch a little Facebook, and we're going to figure out. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to call an audible. I need to meet with the, we're going to meet with the whole media team this week and the lock media team, the global vision media team. We're going to figure out where some other place. I, I got a, a Rumble channel that's verified. We'll start streaming on Rumble. Yeah, you know what else he has? He has a YouTube page, and that honestly deeply upsets me. I have to follow Terms of Service on YouTube. He should have to also, and he most definitely does not. Out of curiosity, let's find out how many Rumble followers he's got or whatever. Um, okay, Greg Locke has... Oh, he's got 5,000 subbies on there. Okay, his YouTube page has over 100,000 now, I think. Uh, over 100,000 subbies. That is a lot of subbies. And so when they, they come against us, we'll just punch back with the truth of the gospel. Amen. We're not going to go away. We're not going to quit. Ultimately, if all the platforms go down, then guess what? 2060, Old Lebanon Dirt Road, Mount Juliet, Tennessee, 1030 on Sunday, 6 o'clock deliverance service, 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. He acts so persecuted. He needs people to believe that he's persecuted. He needs it. 633 prayer on Saturday. Things break loose. We'll just go every day of the week. Praise God. Just feed people, love people, help people, and uh, just have revival all the time. We're not going to stop just because YouTube can't figure out if they want to be uh, communists or not. Okay. And he is, he is convinced that there are communists everywhere, around every corner. Are the communists in the room with us right now, Greg? All right. Okay. So that, that, that's never fun when they, when they do those things. But look, God's got it. We're not worried about it. You, you, better, you better buckle in because it's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets any better in this nation. But once again, trying to convince people that the end is nigh. And if you don't follow his instructions for how to deal with the end or whatever, you will die in Armageddon. It's insane. It's building in fears and phobias is what, it, what it's doing right now. That's what's happening right now. It's honestly sad. I see this kind of thing with cults all the time. But I got news for you. It's going to get better because God's continuing to do a work that is unbelievable in our midst. Not just on this campus, but all over this nation and around the world. I believe God's winding up for a grand slam for the gospel. It's going to be so beautiful. There's so many remnant churches, small and large alike. People remnant church is a reference to something in the Bible. I forget which verse it is, but it's basically alluding to Bible prophecy. They believe that everybody is going to turn away from the church except for a very small number of true believers, and then they're going to pick up arms and everybody who didn't follow God to the end or some other thing. Let me look it up. Remnant Church Bible verse. Uh, Romans 11.5 and Revelation 12.17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. New Testament verses that refer to a faithful remnant include Romans 11.5 and Revelation. So anyway, yeah, that's the belief. That's why he refers to the remnant church. He believes that he is the remnant church. And every other televangelist or evangelical out there who doesn't go to his church, like, for example, Kenneth Copeland followers, are evil and not members of the church. They're actually members of the Church of Satan secretly and all this other crazy stuff. He's the only real Christian in his head, where in reality, he doesn't even follow Christian expectations or biblical expectations. I gave you just one example earlier about him, you know, specifically disobeying what the Bible says intentionally by not following government instructions about lockdown. That's just one of many examples that I have of this guy blatantly breaking Bible expectations because he just doesn't want to do it.
but he's the only true pastor, right? Unwilling to just be be pushed over and bullied and wavered by the culture. And I thank God for every single pastor, every single church that's still standing for truth. Even in this community, good churches that are standing, that are preaching the word of God, that are training people, that are equipping people. We're called to disciple folks. All right, we're called. I ain't got to the preaching yet, but it just stirs me. We're called to disciple people. Really, that's what deliverance ministry is. We're discipling people, right? When he says deliverance ministry, let me explain. Here's why this is important. Deliverance ministry means exorcisms, basically. It's the Protestant word for exorcism. Like, they're trying to exorcise demons from people or whatever, right? And this is brand new for Greg Locke, this whole deliverance ministry thing. Only in the past year or two has he really gotten into deliverance ministry or exorcisms. And I suspect the reason that he's gotten into deliverance ministry recently is because it's a QAnon belief. Because QAnon has this whole formed out system about how demons are possessing all these people and satanic rituals and elites and blah, blah, blah. So I suspect I have circumstantial evidence to believe that Greg Locke fell headfirst into this deliverance stuff as a direct result of his QAnon beliefs, which he does hold. He does hold QAnon beliefs. So anyway, take that for what you will. Let's keep listening to him here. We're discipling people. It's not enough for somebody just to walk an aisle, sign a card, and pray a prayer. The question is, where are those people after they pray that prayer? I want to see their lives change through repentance. I want to see their homes put back together. We're celebrating victory in people's lives and watching the Lord do some marvelous, beautiful, fantabulous things. Fantabulous. Love it. And so we'll just, uh, we'll let them censor us all they want to, but at the end of the day, they... Who's censoring you? What is he talking about? Who's being censored? He's standing up here at his church saying whatever the hell he wants. I don't understand. This is part of the persecution complex he exhibits. No basis to it. He's standing up here saying whatever, and oh my God, as he said some really messed up stuff. If you don't know this guy, holy shit, dude. You guys haven't gone through his book with me, or not, not many of you at the very least, probably some of you, but oh my God, the book is absolutely unglued. No joke. It's nuts. There is no censorship going on right now. Dude's on YouTube and on rumble and on his own website and all this other stuff he's not being censored what is he even talking about he needs to be persecuted and he's simply not they they killed jesus not because of what he did but because of what he said so people that hate truth will hate you when you tell the truth but let me tell you something about truth truth always has a platform isn't that beautiful truth always has a platform and it doesn't have to be on social media Truth always has a platform. Well, as we move into our time of giving today, I want you to be faithful. Okay, now that was the like the announcement section. He puts up this little banner at the bottom when he starts shilling his donation stuff. So let's skip forward because he's got some more singing. And then, yeah, people bowing down. And it's just weird, dude. Really weird. Okay. So I listened to the first couple of minutes of his sermon here, and it gets pretty interesting. So let's give this a listen here. We'll take our text today in the book of Acts, the 12th chapter, if you turn there for just a little while today, the book of Acts. And if this is your first rodeo with Greg Locke, he usually starts out with a Bible verse or, or plans to base it on a Bible verse. Sometimes doesn't even get to read it. Like sometimes doesn't even get to the point where he cracks the Bible in the first place. Most of the time, in fact, almost always, he doesn't refer to the Bible again after that first verse that he reads. He just goes off on tangents about hating gay people and how the government's persecuting him and just all kinds of crazy stuff. We'll see how it goes. And chapter number 12, it's just heavy on my heart. Okay, Acts 12. Under the tent and online, I trust that you'll... Use a Bible and you'll follow along and let the Lord speak to your heart in such a very precious way. I'm not going to have you stand and read the text. Uh, yeah, usually he has people stand when the Bible is read in his church. That's weird, right? I don't know. Jehovah's Witnesses use the Bible a lot, incorrectly, 
but they do read a lot of Bible verses throughout, you know, their sermons or whatever. They couldn't possibly have people stand to read every verse because it, they'd just be up, down, up, down, up, down. Like I said, Greg Locke reads maybe one verse, if that, usually. So we'll see how this one goes. Uh, merely because of the fact that I'm going to preach right back through the same 17 verses, and it'll take just a little bit of time to to have you stand and read those 17 verses. And so I'm going to go back and read every single one of them. And I'm going to preach just uh, through all of them today. And so I'm well aware of the fact that when I was in college, they say things like this. Don't ever tell people how many points you got. Don't ever tell people how many verses you've got. See what I'm saying? Like the guy was telling us, he told everyone to stand. He's supposed to be reading a Bible verse right now. And for some reason, he's gone off on some weird tangent about college or something. Like, I don't understand what's happening right now. Because they'll be clicking them off and they'll be counting them down. Well, I, I don't think you're here to see how quick you can get out. Amen. I think you're here to let the word of God absorb into your heart. The Bible says to meditate. What's the word? Dude, are you going to get to the Bible verses or not? This is what I'm talking about. He just goes off on tangents that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. Meditate. The Bible means it means to marinate. It's like a good piece of meat. You marinate that meat, then you cook it up. So we're going to marinate in the word of the Lord today. In a some people, very familiar story. For others, maybe not so familiar. But certainly, some very wonderful, powerful, and familiar principles that we're going to have to entertain in our hearts and our minds today. Some things that I need you to wrap your head around. I'm going to go slow. I know the last few weeks I have purposely tried to dial back on my... Dude, just get to the Bible verse. Are you kidding me? What is he even talking about right now? Who cares? I thought this is supposed to be a sermon about the Bible, right? Is he going to read the Bible verse or not? He's going to stand up here and talk about how much he loves the Bible instead of reading the fucking thing. Come on. Uh, big charismatic personality just because I want you to get the punch to the gut that the Holy Spirit is trying to give all of us. And so oftentimes people say both here and around the world, oh, pastor, I just want you to know that message stepped all over my toes. I say, well, I was missing the mark then because I wasn't aiming for your toes. I was going for your heart. See, this is really funny, actually. God, I couldn't have picked a better moment to mention the fact that the dude doesn't even get to Bible verses most of the time. Because <laughs> seriously, he said, okay, we're going to turn to act. Are these people still standing? Didn't he ask them to stand? This is how it goes usually in his sermons. He starts out, he says, we're going to base it on act 17. Doesn't give us the verses yet. He's about to give them to us. And then he never fucking gets to it. What's going on here? Jesus, this guy does not know how to, like, stay on topic at all. He's like Donald Trump, actually. He does things the exact same way. He's not following an outline or anything. He's just kind of going for it, you know, and not, not really making much sense in the process. And so I, I'm trying to shepherd your heart. And uh, don't ever get to a place where you believe when people say things like this. Well, just follow your heart. No, the Bible says that your heart is desperately wicked and deceitful of all things. Who can know it? So we have to preach to the heart so we can change the heart. I can change your mind, but if your mind is changed and your heart is still corrupt and perverted, it's not going to change your life. Okay, you can change your mind without changing your life. But when you get your heart change, you get a new heart, you get a new start. Can I get a Okay, I don't know what he means by heart. I wish he would define the word heart here because what's the difference between changing someone's heart and changing someone's mind? Isn't that fundamentally just kind of the same thing? Like changing the way that they view the world or whatever? Aren't they just the same like things? I don't understand what, what he's trying to get at with this. A witness, amen. It, it, I feel like he's using, it's not a deepity, but it's like, it's, a deepity is something very specific, and it wouldn't apply here, but I feel like he's trying to say something that sounds really profound, but it's not profound at all. It's just nonsense. So I want to change your heart about some things today and just use this, this beautiful story that the Lord has used in my own life, and we're just going to make some application and some principles just as we rock through the text. Amen? So let's pray, and we'll get right into Acts chapter number 12. Father, in Jesus' name I ask that you will do in this service, both in the room and those that are watching, what Greg Locke cannot do. Lord, we thank you for a beautiful time of worship. We thank you that indeed the very presence of Jesus is what makes heaven heaven. Without Jesus, it doesn't matter if there's streets of gold, it doesn't matter if there's angels, it doesn't matter if there's all of these things. Without the presence of Jesus, there's no heaven. And Lord, even on this earth, without the presence of Jesus, nothing matters. Nothing matters in this tent. 
We can be in the presence of each other, and we can be in the presence of Greg Locke. la di da da We need the presence of God. See, he's just going through prayers and stuff. This is bizarre. So, Lord, we ask that you would manifest your glory. And we know that when it comes to your presence, there's an eternal presence of God everywhere, all at the same time. But there's only some time that you manifest your presence. That you walk into a room and you change the atmosphere. So, Father, I pray that you will do what we cannot do for ourselves, because if we could figure it out, we would have done it already. Our hearts are in need of revival. Lord, no doubt there are many people here that have a longing hunger for the truth of God's Word. Feel that hunger. As we said a moment ago during our, I'll feel your mom. our introductory comments in the offering, Lord, may this be the day. May I not worry about another day. There's two days on the calendar of God, today and that day. Okay, he's said this a billion times. This is one of his favorite sayings. There are two days on the calendar, today and that day. I.e., I guess the end is what he's getting at. He's an apocalypticist. He's obsessed with the end. And he deeply to the bottom of his heart believes that the end will be here in the next few months. He hasn't given us a specific date or a specific timeline, but he says it's here. We're in the season. It'll happen any five minutes now, basically. And we, be ready to, we better be ready today for that day, because that day's coming. So, Lord, help us to focus by faith on the Word of God. Remove distractions. Lord, I'm not so naive as to think that there's people in this room that are just absolutely hurting and broken, and so I, I speak a word of power and grace and healing and hope and comfort over them right now. May that spirit of heaviness be lifted in this room so that the glory of God can fall. And we can walk out changed men and women for the glory of God. And we'll thank you for it. In Dude, that was a long, pointless prayer. Oh, my God. In the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said. Amen. I've often told you that the book of Acts and all of its 28 action-packed chapters are hands down my favorite book in the entirety of the New Testament. Oh, yeah. We were supposed to be talking about the book of Acts. Right. Something we still haven't gotten to. Wasn't he supposed to, like, are they still standing? I think he told them to stand, didn't he? And they were standing there waiting for him to read the verse. And here we sit still waiting. And how far in are we? I think we're like at least five minutes into his full sermon, right? This is nutty. Shall I say it's my favorite book in the entirety of the Bible? I want to. I think my favorite book is the book of Romans, uh, kind of unrelated. I'm, I'm supposed to be letting him talk here, but the book of Romans was written to a congregation that oh my god i just lost everything in 30 seconds or less the book of romans was written to a congregation that was formed out without paul's supervision the others had paul's supervision and it was the book of romans was written with the intent to guide them to help them learn to be christians basically follow the expectations that jesus laid out or whatever else so that's the book of Romans, and that is where you find a lot of the, if you rebel against the government, then you're a piece of shit. If you, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself and treat others the way you want to be treated, and, and a lot of that other stuff. That's where a lot of that stuff comes from. Church that looks like it popped right out of the book of Acts. I often tell people, and I often notate to my pastor friends, everybody wants a biblical church until the book of Acts starts breaking out all over the church house. Oh, fascinating. So he's saying he likes Acts because it's more hellfire and damnation than some of the others? Interesting. I like Romans because it's not as hellfire and damnation. And then things look a little bit different. And I want you to know that the reason there is no ending to the book of Acts is because prophetically we are still the fulfillment of Acts chapter 29. We are still watching God do today what he began 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. God's not dead. God's still speaking. And there's still authority in the word of God. If you believe that, can I get a witness today? Okay, that's, that's complete nonsense. What he just said is unbiblical. It's an unbiblical belief that he holds. He says, the book of Acts doesn't have an ending. The book of Mark didn't have an ending either originally. And monks, like hundreds of years later, noted that there was no like real ending in the book of Mark. And they didn't like that. So they added, I don't know, 16 verses or something like that to the very last chapter of Mark, right? And we know for a fact that those verses were added later. And they're 
completely out of sync with the tone and intentions of the book of Mark. Like it, it makes no sense for the verses to be in there with what they say. Like it, it's totally different. So anyway, some books just don't have an ending and that could be for a variety of reasons. One reason could be because we lost the ending. Maybe we didn't recover it. That, I mean, that's very possible. In fact, I'd say likely. One reason could be because the people writing it didn't get an opportunity to finish it. There are a bunch of reasons. But Greg Locke is going with the, the completely unbiblical reason of because we're still fulfilling the ending today. There's no reason to believe that. But nobody ever accused this guy of being biblical. So. Hey. So the book of Acts may have some strange stories, may have some unusual analogies, but it's got principles that are packed with spiritual, theological, doctrinal truth that we must learn to sink our teeth into if we're going to get off the milk and grow into the meat. So what Dude, have we even read a verse yet? I don't think we have, right? I think we're we're still way is his crowd still standing? What's happening in the middle of this book in chapter 12 is strict persecution from the government has come down upon the people now i'm not oh please like i said i'm reading his book right now like uh this is war we will not surrender through silence i'm reading it right now and the overarching theme through the entire thing is persecution greg Locke is persecuted christians are persecuted and the reason that he leans into it is because he thinks that's going to work people into a blood frenzy such that they will be motivated to bring about the end themselves. They'll be motivated to bring the end of whatever. I don't know. I mean, he thinks that's what's going to be necessary to bring about Armageddon, basically, for everybody to feel like they're persecuted. It'll bring more people into the church, basically going to make applications and analogies that aren't there. But unless you cannot pay attention to the season that we are in, you better know something and you better know something well. Things are going to progressively and continually get worse in this nation and around the world for anybody that calls themselves a blood ball, born again, Bible-believing child of God. You and I have become public enemy number one. And if you don't believe that, you have not watched five minutes of the news lately. They're building a narrative. And the narrative is the churchgoers are the troublemakers. Okay, Greg Locke doesn't actually watch the news. He said, you're not watching the news right now. He doesn't watch the news. You know what he does? He reads other people's assessments of news articles on Facebook. He talks about the articles that his grandma sends him or whatever because she's all freaked out that like the end is right around the corner. That's how he, I believe that's how he consumes his news. That's the impression that I get. Because I am constantly, constantly hearing things from Greg Locke that came straight from, like, famously fake Facebook posts and stuff. Viral, fake Facebook news. He's repeating that all the time. Like, the idea that McDonald's is, like, promoting witchcraft and happy meals it's trying to get kids to practice spells and happy meals and stuff and just insane insane stuff constantly from him by the way they have to build that narrative because it's exactly what the antichrist is going to say when he sets up shop and by the way the beast system is already here in place right this very moment the beast system is that what he said this is getting into deep revelation lore that I'm only a little familiar with because Jehovah's Witnesses have different beliefs about all of this than others, and that's how I grew up. So I know Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs on it backward and forward, but I don't know. It's going to be... Uh, we'll see if we can wade through this. I'm hoping I'll be able to figure out what he's getting at, what he's trying to communicate. It would take very little to any moments in time for somebody to stand up and say you know what let's just all come together under the banner of peace under the banner of love they shall cry peace peace but sudden destruction shall come upon them the bible plainly says right so that's one of the famous like claims in the bible when the end is near they will claim that peace is here and then they're going to persecute religious people. They're going to ban religion worldwide. Religion will be banned worldwide in many evangelicals' views. 
so when they call for world peace, then they're going to ban religion and hunt them down. Jehovah's Witnesses have a big persecution complex about this, too. And then Armageddon comes, basically, or the rapture comes or something like that. Now, Greg Locke is unique in the sense that he actually believes that Christians are going to be raptured before a lot of the struggles take place that Christians believe they're going to have to face. So many Christians think that they're going to have to deal with seven years of like Jacob's troubles or whatever. Greg Locke does not really believe that. Uh, I think he he believes that he's never going to need to face the Antichrist or he's not going to need to identify the Antichrist because he's going to be raptured first. That's that is unique among Greg Locke and his believers. So I'm not sure if he still believes that. But that's what he put down in his book back in October 2022. I just read it the other day. It was like chapter two or something. And so we're living in days when we have become the enemies, not just politically, but in every way imaginable. We are the cog in the wheel for the progressive left to continue the nonsense of diabolically dismantling the authority of the Word of God and literally bringing this country to its knees. We are the ones that are in the way. My monitors just came on. Thanks be unto God. I can hear myself now. We're about to preach. Fantastic. Preach to your heart's content. Nobody is trying to stop you from doing so. But did you notice what he said there? I thought this is kind of interesting. He said he is standing in the left's way and the left is trying to destroy him. Democrats are trying to destroy him for that reason. He believes that the, the left or Democrats are the root of all evil, the epitome of evil. That's his belief on it. And he said, if you're a Democrat, you do not belong in his church. He said that just the other day, which is, to my knowledge, very illegal, according to, like, he should be losing his tax-exempt status for something like that. But that's neither here nor there. That's a totally different story. Anyway, he views anybody to the left of hunting the homeless for sport as the root of all evil. Just remember that as we continue through. So we have to understand, in context, the people of God were growing by leaps and bounds. But persecution had arisen strictly throughout the land. Now somebody needs to understand that the reason, even though China is a diabolical, demonic mess right now, do you know why the church in China is growing in more number and in more solid doctrinal understanding than any church movement in America. I'll tell you why. Wait, 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 wait. Isn't the church banned in China? I'm pretty sure it's banned. Chi uh, Chinese who are over the age of 18 are only permitted to join officially sanctioned Christian groups, which are registered with the government-sanctioned Catholic Patriotic Church, the China Christian Council, and the Protestant Three Self Church. Weird. Okay. Yeah. So I like Jehovah's Witnesses send people to China to preach to others underground secretly. I think that's a terrible idea. That's a good way to get people like, you know, arrested and seriously hurt by the government. Uh, but anyway, the church is not really even legal in China. So I'm not sure what he's talking about. I mean, to some degree, I guess it's legal, but it's just their specific brand of church that's allowed. It's not just any Christian church. Ah, because persecution always brings revival. So he's claiming that the Christian church is persecuted in China, and as a result, the Christian church in China is bigger than the Christian church in America? Am I reading this correctly? Do you know what prosperity does? It brings about a spirit of being lukewarm in the church. We've got Prosperity brings about a spirit of being lukewarm. Wow. So he's laying it out here for us right now. If you're not persecuted, then you don't really love God. That That's, the, that's what I'm reading from this. Is that what you guys are picking up too? got our fancy buildings i say that in quotations praise the lord we've got all of our stuff we got money in the bank we have a staff we have administration we have seminaries we have books 
We have coffee shops. We have Christian this and Christian that. Christian television, Christian music, Christian concerts, Christian award ceremonies, everything. Wow. I thought you were trying to convince me that Christianity is persecuted in America. <laughs> this guy's given us all the reasons why Christianity is absolutely not persecuted in America like at all. You've got Christian everything in America. It's Christian city here. America is the most steeped in Christianity 24-7, and it's only getting worse right now. It's hard to get by if you're not, not just if you're not a Christian, but if you're not this very specific brand of Christian. Like, I was a Jehovah's Witness growing up, and I had a lot of trouble getting by and, and like, making friends and, and stuff. And that's partly because of the Jehovah's Witness beliefs and religion and stuff, certainly. But people viewed me as very, very different from them. And I was culturally completely different from everybody in school, from everybody around me, because they're one brand of Christianity and I was another. Not only do you have to be Christian, you have to be their brand of Christian. Like, it's really hard to get by otherwise, honestly. We have books... We have coffee shops, we have Christian this and Christian that, Christian television, Christian music, Christian concerts, Christian award ceremonies, everything's Christian, 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 to the place that now nothing seems to be Christian. That doesn't make any sense. That makes literally zero sense. I don't understand what he's even talking about right now. You have so much Christian stuff that nothing is Christian? What? That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. What is he even talking about? Every sports hero now follows Jesus, apparently. Every singer loves to use the name Jesus. They can get up in a song and they can F-bomb and they can use every wicked, vile, gutterish, perverted language that you can imagine. But like, I think he, do you think he's referring to wet-ass P-word right now? <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with that meme, Ben Shapiro... Uh, <laughs> Ben Shapiro was talking about like how evil it is that Cardi B, maybe I'm not sure who's saying this song. Uh, he's talking about how evil this song was. And the song was he kept referring to it as wet ass P word <laughs> instead of its actual name. I don't know why. Oh, my God. But when they win their award, they stand behind a podium of lies and they simply say, I would like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I would like to think that God changed your life and cleaned up your mouth before you started dropping all that nonsense in your song. Really? You would like to think that God cleaned up people's mouths, huh? I actually, you know, I've been collecting Locke, Greg Locke clips for a long time and i actually have him on video swearing a lot i've got a bunch of swears from this guy i i guess i don't really have time to go through and find each one maybe i'll do a compilation later i'll do a compilation of him swearing from the pulpit later and i'll uh i'll talk about it on one of my channels soon he swears a lot well a lot more than pastors should and i don't mean slurs he uses slurs too against gay people and stuff but I mean, like, full-blown swears, like, for no reason, like, hell and damn and piss and, and stuff like that. Out of context, too. Not, like, in context hell. So now we have a generation of fickle people that don't understand persecution. So when persecution begins, everybody wants to deny its reality and say, oh, no, the church is not going to be involved in any persecution. After all... Buckle in. la di da da Jesus is going to snatch us out of here, and we're never going to have any problems. You've been lied to! Well, Greg Locke actually said that in his book. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. He says you've been lied to. He said before the Antichrist comes along, before the time of Jacob's troubles or the seven years of suffering or whatever, Christians, true Christians, are going to be raptured out. So, ouch. Yeah, that's a little rough. He, maybe he, he was hoping people weren't going to read his book from 2020 before coming to this service. But I do my research. I do my homework. I'll just put it that way. You know what? Why not? Let's pull that, that section up since I have his book pulled up anyway. I'll show you. I personally believe we'll have the unmerited blessing of a pre-tribulation rapture, praise God, 
with Jesus returning to claim his church before the tribulation actually begins. I don't find this to be a divisive topic, but some do, so I hope you don't let this issue distract you from the message if you're in another camp. As long as you believe Jesus is indeed returning to claim his church at some point surrounding the tribulation period, and believe that we need to prepare for very dark days regardless of which camp you claim, we're actually on the same side of the bigger debate. Okay, well maybe... I don't know. He says, and believe we need to prepare for dairy, very dark days. So I guess I'm not really sure what he believes. It says pre-tribulation. He's a pre-tribulation rapture believer or whatever. So I'm really not even sure what he's talking about right now. Like, why is he freaked out at all? Doesn't really make sense to me. It, it seems to me that he shouldn't be worried about anything, right? I don't know. This is just a big confusing mess. You have been lied to. We are going to be delivered from the wrath of God. We are not going to be delivered from the wrath of man. That's interesting. He, he thinks that people are going to be delivered from the wrath of God, but they're still going to suffer at the hands of like persecution, at the hands of men or whatever. Interesting. Okay. I'm telling you, some of us are going to prison for our faith. Some of us, if Jesus Terry, if this thing continues on the course that it is, I don't care what you think about Greg Log, I don't care if you ever come back to this tent, I'm telling you, some people in this tent and watching online in the next 20 years will be martyrs for the gospel if it keeps going the way it's going. Oh, please. Well, that's interesting. I feel like he kind of gave us a time frame just now, didn't he? The next 20 years. Fascinating. Oh, he's so obsessed with persecution, though. Oh, my God. He deeply to the bottom of his heart believes that he's going to be like sent to prison. In fact, he even fantasizes about it. Seriously, I'm not joking. Well, I covered it on one of my videos recently. I'm just not, I don't have it pulled up right now. Anyway, he went through this big, long, drawn out, like vivid depiction of what's going to happen when the government comes to get him. And it says that his wife is, he's talked about this with his security staff and his wife and everybody. His wife, he's told her if she's not being arrested too, she might be, then she needs to hold the phone, that, that the recorder, you know, the camera, hold the camera and get right up in his face so that he can see, so everybody can see what's happening and listen to his message and it'll go out all over social media. So she's going to hold the phone. His security staff said, well, should we like try to get you out the back door if they come to get you? And he's like, no, no, I want I want the world to see me being arrested and stuff. Seriously, this is like the definition of persecution porn. Like, I don't know what else to call it. It's absolutely unhinged from reality. This thing's not slowing down anytime soon. The persecution is here. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Christians are the most privileged group in the country. In no stretch of the imagination are Christians persecuted in America like not even a little bit but I must be honest please I'm do. not going to be discouraged because the persecution is what brings about the revival it comes through the back door of persecution not through the front door of prosperity that's what she said that's why the prosperity gospel has been birthed out of hell it's not a kingdom-minded theology. It's health, wealth-wise. You know what the prosperity gospel offers the world? The same thing the devil offered Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Wow, that's actually really interesting. I think that's pretty insightful. Just worship me and I'll give you everything you want. That's really interesting. That's probably the most insightful thing that I've ever heard from Greg Locke, which is not saying much. But Greg Locke, if you don't know the guy, he really doesn't like Kenneth Copeland, like at all. He, he hates Kenneth Copeland. Not Cop no, I'm sorry, not just Copeland, but like Joel Osteen and all of the televangelists, all the famous televangelists. He cannot stand them. And he's come out and said some pretty on-the-nose stuff about him, made some pretty specific claims about him, to say the least, about them being like into young people, if you will. I don't know how else to phrase this to be diplomatic. Completely disconnected from reality, not accurate in any way. But anyways, or no reason, no basis for any of these beliefs. But anyways, yeah, Greg Locke has said all of this stuff openly about Joel Osteen and others. Um, he absolutely hates them. And that's probably why he's coming after prosperity gospel, because he knows that's kind of their thing prosperity gospel and he wants to take him down for it which i'm all for i am 
I am in favor of people criticizing and attacking prosperity gospel, and I am absolutely in favor of Christian infighting. Love it to death. Love every bit of it. And we have so much affluence in the American church. When persecution comes, people just give up. Affluence, you say. Huh. What does affluence mean? Is that the word? Hang on. It's on the tip of my tongue. Doesn't affluence mean basically privilege? Is that what it is? I thought he was just talking about how persecuted the church is. Is that weird to anybody else? Is the church persecuted or is it affluent? It can only be one, right? Which one? Now, regardless of what happened in 2020, at this point, it doesn't make any difference because that was just a small gearing up to what is about to transpire in this nation. And you see how quickly people want to decide with friends and family and have everybody love them and everybody like them and even twisted and contorted the Bible to fit the narrative That God has called the church to be a coward and to be sheepish and to just simply go along with the flow of everything that's coming against it. And that is the absolute work of the devil because the... Oh, I love it, dude. I love it. He is literally... What he just said is... what. Let me just step back because this is listening to again. Or this is worth listening to again. Listen to this. The Bible to fit the narrative that God has called the church to be a coward and to be sheepish... Wow. People are trying to sell others the narrative that the church is supposed to be sheepish. Is that funny to anybody else? Didn't Jesus literally refer to his followers as sheep? Am I forgetting something here? Am I missing something? Is there some verse I'm overlooking? Didn't the Bible specifically say the meek shall inherit the earth? Does anybody else remember this? Am I misremembering? And this guy is literally contradicting the Bible right now. Right? Is he not contradicting the Bible in in clear terms? This is nuts. He is completely unbiblical. I don't say this about every pastor. You know, you can justify any moral position that you want, any moral position, by using the Bible because it's such a big book full of so many contradictory things. It doesn't espouse any moral positions that it doesn't reverse a chapter later practically, right? But in this one case, Greg Locke seems to actually be contradicting the Bible. It seems to me. Let me know what you guys think about that in the comments. And to just simply go along with the flow of everything that's coming against it. And that is the absolute work of the devil because the Antichrist will do that very thing to silence the mouth of those of us that stand for righteousness. And when we keep standing and won't keep our mouth closed, they're going to kill us. He is absolutely obsessed with making people believe they're persecuted, desperate. He will do anything to convince them of it, anything. Those are the facts. And it's a fact according to the Bible, not just according to Greg Locke's political opinion. It is a fact. Okay, there are going to be many, the Bible says, at the throne of the Lamb that were beheaded for the testimony of the Word of God. I'm telling you, it's coming at an alarming rate. And here- okay, great. Uh, there, no, it is not coming at an alarming rate. You can claim that it's coming, but by no stretch of the imagination is it coming at an alarming rate. You, feel free to claim that if you want, but no one has any reason to believe you until we see some evidence of it, which, you know, coming any day, right? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get that evidence one of these days, I assume. We'll, we're still waiting. I'm sure it'll come. Here's what we don't like to think about. Did you know that there are more martyrs for Christ right now around the world than at any other time in the history of the world? Well, that's technically maybe true, depending on what you mean by martyr. People who believed in Jesus being killed for their belief, I I guess maybe that's true in some African countries, maybe, or in China or something. Strictly as a function of how many humans there are on Earth, but on a per capita basis... No, absolutely not. I would say, I don't know. I I mean, I have no idea, honestly. And I have no idea what what basis he has to even believe this stuff in the first place. How did he come to these conclusions? Does he have a study that he can point to to show us, like, people dying for Jesus or whatever? Of course he doesn't. He just believes this stuff blindly 
because he thinks that's what the Bible's saying. He believes that his interpretation of the Bible is correct when, you know, in my opinion, it's absolutely not. People are having their eyes for simply standing up for Jesus. Oh, please, don't go down this road. I want to keep monetization. All over the world, and we don't want to think about that. You know, we, we like third world countries in National Geographic, but we don't want to think about the fact that Islam today is off. Oh, my God, please just. <sighs> That's true. I mean, fair enough. You know, Islam, people do some ugly things in the name of Islam. Absolutely. I'm the last person to defend, you know, any religion out there, honestly. There are a lot of religions out there that are deeply destructive to this, to society and to the lives of the people that are in it. If you think Christianity hasn't had its run of ugliness, then you live in a delusional fantasy land. I mean, just look no further than the Crusades. Honestly, I don't know why people don't look at the Crusades as what they were, which is a Holocaust. It just deeply disgustingly ugly events in history for which Christians are entirely to blame entirely like there's no other scapegoat here it was Christians that did that I'm just laying it out there yeah Islam has its problems right now it never really faced an enlightenment period the way that Christianity did but this guy is trying to take us back to the dark ages as hard as he possibly can because they won't renounce the gospel of Jesus Christ yeah, let's not forget the Spanish Inquisition, right? Children that have more theological understanding than most pastors I know are being placed in cages and alive. Oh, my God, please. I don't need the vivid imagery, and neither does YouTube. You know, uh, you know what? Actually, this one isn't on YouTube, I don't think, this video that he released. He does have a YouTube channel that he releases to regularly. I don't think this one is on there. Like I said, you know, I'm the last person to defend Islam. It's not great at all. In fact, it's pretty destructive to people's lives. But I feel like what he's doing right now is trying to scapegoat Islam and pretending that Christianity doesn't have any problems at all or doesn't have a history with this kind of ugly thing. But the media don't want to talk about that. Because it's not happening here. You know what's happening here? We have people like Greg Locke screaming about being persecuted while he says that, you know, gay people should receive the death penalty for just being alive. That's what's happening here. That's why the media talks about Greg Locke rather than Islam. Just putting it out there. What's even more sad and sickening is the church don't want to talk about it. Why would they? It's not happening here. It's not a problem in this country right here right now there are a lot of issues that need to be resolved with islam like desperately and people should be talking about it a lot more than they are i don't talk about it much islam because i feel like i don't know enough about the culture the religion the beliefs or the anything else i i, I don't know anywhere near as much as as many other people do so i leave it to the other people to talk about generally that's why i don't cover it People around the world giving up their life for the cause of Christ. And honestly, the lukewarm church in America wouldn't even give up a cup of coffee for him. We're so prosperous. You say, I don't have a whole lot of money. Go to a third world country. You are rich beyond your wildest imagination. Oh, I love it. The dude is basically disproving the premise of the whole thing that he's been saying up to this point. He's saying how persecuted he is as a Christian. That's all he's been talking about this entire time. That's what his entire 200-something page book is about, the fact that Greg Locke is persecuted. And now he's sitting here directly contradicting that. Fascinating. These people have nothing, and all they do is beg for Bibles and beg for the power of the Holy Spirit. By the way, these people in these countries, they're not fussing about nonsense. You don't see these people on Facebook fussing about things that don't matter. They know their friends and family are going to bust hell wide open, and their whole life is consumed with a passion for Jesus and the power and presence of the Holy Ghost. They just want to please the Father, and they'll die for Jesus. And we have propagated a religion denominationally in America that talks about for a God they don't even live for every day. Wow, that's really interesting. Just the, the, his whole viewpoint on this thing is, is absolutely fascinating to me. 
people. I, I think it's kind of gross to glorify dying for something or somebody or whatever, but okay, whatever. We're talking about, well, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to jail for my faith. Why don't you go to church for your faith? That would help. Oh my God. He's describing everything that he talks about constantly. He's always talking about going to jail for his faith. And now he's criticizing people who talk about that. Fascinating, right? Oh my God. This is weird. Do you think JWs and Greg Locke would like to kill apostates like they do in the Islamic republics? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Most definitely they would. Yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses are pacifists. They're very, very nonviolent. I don't think that they want to do it, but they most definitely want apostates gone. If they could snap their fingers and be done with it and not have to get their hands dirty, then Jehovah's Witnesses would absolutely do it. Yes. Greg Locke, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. He most definitely does want apostates dead. No doubt. Wow, this is really interesting, man. I'll tell you what, I'm going to continue this tomorrow morning on my Telltale Unfiltered YouTube channel. Link in the description. Again, if you missed the live stream, you're watching this later, go to Telltale Unfiltered. I may have already edited and uploaded. It takes me about a week to do the edits. So if it's been a week, then check there anyways. And you should be able to see, like, the final product. But anyway, yeah, I appreciate you guys coming and hanging out. It's been a fun time. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to get out of here. Again, if you want to see more, then come watch my unfiltered channel tomorrow morning, okay? All right, thank you guys so much for coming. I will see you guys hopefully tomorrow morning. If not, I will see you guys next week.